knitters. Welcome to episode 92 of the Nitty McPurly podcast. I'm Devin Ventry. You can find me online as Nitty McPurly at nittymcpurly.com, over on Instagram as Nitty McPurly. Uh, and if you want to email me, I am Devin at nittymcpurly.com. Thank you so much for joining me. I am so happy to see you guys here as always. Welcome to this week. This is the last week of August coming into the very end of the summer. All my kids are now back to school, which is great. Super excited. Uh, my teenagers can drive to school on their own. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of ready for, gosh darn, I'm kind of ready for fall. Um, look out for future you. Go pre-order your advent calendar. Um, coming down to the wire, I do not have a million of these left. So if you want to pre-order an advent calendar, please go do that. Um, yes, those are available in my shop right now. You can find those uh, as shown on the screen here. I have a shop update in one week this Saturday, September 3rd, I think it is, at noon. I'm going to be having a big shop update, and I'm going to be talking about that right now in progress and shop news. I think I'll start with progress. In terms of knitting, I didn't do a huge amount of knitting this week, but I made a lot of progress in other areas. So I'm still working on my Vesper sweater that I talked about last time. Uh, it just gets slightly longer every time. I I've been learning more about sleeves and we're gonna talk about that today. I'm going to go deeper with the sleeve than a regular like dolman sleeve. We're gonna talk about all that today when we get to sleeves, but I don't think I'm going to go all the way to the waist with the sleeve because I just don't think it's gonna work out as a knitting pattern with different sizes. Like I just, I, I think that's, it's just a little bit impractical. But we'll see, we'll see. I'll keep you updated on that project as it progresses. It is really fun, I'm really enjoying it. I love that it's plain stockinette, but that I'm changing colors so it keeps it a little more interesting. That's really fun. Uh, the shop update, I'm very excited about the shop update. It's going to be big, um, big, big. So let's start with yarn. I have wanted for a long time to have sweater quantities of yarn readily available in colors that are always there on my website, but choosing the colors and there are many things that got in the way of this up until now, but I'm on the brink. And this shop update is not even going to have all of it. I have eight bases and 12 colors. So, you know, do the math. Um, that's the different numbers of things that I will ultimately have available. But right now, as of right now, I have fully dyed up four colors across all eight bases. And then this week I will get a couple more, but all 12 probably will not be up by this shop update. So I'm hoping again in September, later in September to have another shop update. I'm going to show you Bougie, which is a color I know a lot of you like and that is already done. Here I have kind of a, a pyramid of Fontaine, sort of off to the side there. But I wanna go through all the different bases that I offer. Um, we'll start with the chunkiest. This is St. Petersburg, super bulky, and all the ones I'm gonna show you today are in Bougie, which is a really, really light pink. Um, St. Petersburg Super Bulky is 100% Andean Highland wool, and it is non-superwash. I have two bases that are non-superwash. The Freetown Fingering Weight, uh, which is 100% non-superwash fine organic merino, and this is really nice. It is um, an organic wool that is super soft and wonderful for accessories or sweaters or whatever you wanted to make with that. Um, so those are my two non-superwash bases, St. Petersburg Super Bulky and Freetown Fingering Weight. The rest of my bases are a superwash. Now the Aran base is an MCN, 
the, oops, sorry, that's, Ber this is Berlin Bulky, sorry. Berlin Bulky is 100% fine superwash merino and it is um, what my everywhere sweater is made with, held double with the uh, Munich mohair. So one thing that's interesting about mohair is that a skein of mohair is only 50 grams, but it is 459 yards. So it doesn't weigh very much because it is so thin, but if you get a skein of mohair, it's gonna last you a long time. For example, I wanna say, I don't have the numbers directly in my head ready for access, but it's about seven skeins of the bulky and only two skeins of the mohair for uh, my size of the everywhere sweater, I think. Pretty sure that's what it was. But because there's so many yards in the mohair, it just goes really far, even though it's only a 50 gram skein. So the Munich mohair is 72% kid mohair and 26% silk, which is pretty standard as mohair goes. Now we get on to the Amsterdam Erin. You'll notice that all of my yarns have a European, mostly European, um, cities theme to them. Some of them are not in Europe. But the Amsterdam Erin is an MCN. It's 80% superwash merino, 10% cashmere, 10% nylon. And as a result, I don't have great light today. It's blowing out a little bit. But as a result, the Amsterdam Erin takes the dye in a super interesting way. Sorry, it's, it's a little bit over bright and a little dark at the same time but it takes it in a way that's very variegated because of the different fiber contents. I just love that. I think that's awesome. Depending on the type of fiber, the dye adheres in a different way. And that is just, it's a beautiful thing. So, uh, okay, moving right along, I have two workhorse yarns, the Warsaw Worsted and the Dubrovnik DK. These yarns are ones that I chose very carefully in terms of my base. I wanted to have workhorse yarns that were great for sweaters. That was my main goal in choosing these. I actually tried a couple of other bases before I tried these. And a lot of the super wash is too drapey and too soft. It doesn't have enough strength to it to maintain a great sweater shape. It feels nice when you're knitting with it, but when your sweater is done, it doesn't lay as nicely as a yarn that has a little bit more crispness to it like these. So if you're knitting a sweater, I highly recommend um, either the Warsaw Worsted or the Dubrovnik Decay, depending on what your pattern calls for, because these are great, great sweater yarns. Now, if you were gonna knit a shawl or something that you wanted a lot of drape, I would not go with these. These are, you know, because these weights are more commonly used in sweaters, that's why I chose these for my base. But if you wanted one with a lot of drape, you'd probably wanna go with one of the softer ones. Just my opinion. Uh, and my last base is the Frankfurt Fingering Weight, which is great. It's a 75-25 merino nylon. Um, it's super wash, great for socks, has a lot of drape. This is my go-to shawl knitting yarn. Um, the Freetown Fingering would also be great for a shawl, but uh, it is a single ply and it is non-super wash. So I would not go with this for socks because it's going to pill. I wouldn't really probably choose it for a sweater that's gonna get a lot of wear because it's going to get pills under the arms because it is a single ply non-super wash. However, it is extremely luxurious. It's very soft, it's organic. It would be great for a baby item that isn't you know, that you're gonna give carefully because it can't go in the washing machine. Like a baby sweater for like a baptism or a baptismal gown or a shawl that's very special. Um, this is a special yarn. It's just, it's fabulous. Uh, Frankfurt fingering, you're gonna get a lot of that luxe look without the drawbacks of something like pilling or, you know, not being able to be thrown in the washing machine. Um, all of this yarn is hand wash, dry flat, even if it is a superwash, 
that's the kind of thing where, you know, if you do throw it in the washing machine on like delicate or hand wash cycle, it's going to come out just fine, especially if you lay it flat to dry, but um, it's not recommended. Now, the non-super wash is, you, you can't wash it. Don't put it in the washing machine or it will felt. So if you're making something that you want to felt, like a felted slipper or something like that, then, you know, by all means, go for it. But that's why I only have two non-super wash bases. Great for hats. Uh, non-super wash is kind of awesome and organic and natural, but it's not quite as um, versatile and it just is not gonna hold up to hard wear in the same way that the super wash yarn is. So those are the eight bases. I plan to have color cards down the line. I actually already have them. I just need to get all of my yarn dyed and you know put together in the color cards. A color card is going to have a sample of every base and every color, which is just gonna be awesome. I'm so excited about those. Probably later in September, I will have those. Um, this month, not this month, but this season's new scent is apple cranberry. Sorry, it's, it's both dark and too bright at the same time. <laughs> uh, and I have these beautiful vintage apple pictures to go on my apple cranberry wool wash, which is shown here in an eight ounce bottle. This is great for knitters who do a lot of hand washing. If you are going to be giving a hand wash knitted gift and you wanted to include a small bottle of wool wash, I recommend these little four ounce bottles. Uh, these will be in the shop update, as well as Nitty McPearly hand balm in apple cranberry. Oh my gosh, isn't it so cute? I have two ounce hand balms in these adorable little containers and half ounce hand balms in these sticks. All of this packaging is made in the U made in the US, you guys. It's not easy to do, but I did it. It took me a long time, but I got there. So, all of these things are going to be available in the shop update. Also, there's more. Like you can see why it's taken me so long to put this thing together. Uh, also, uh, from Jennifer Yun, I have more of the scissor sleeves. Sorry, I didn't I didn't bring a pair of scissors up here. I have more of the scissor sleeves in ochre. I'll put up a picture so you can see what it looks like with the sleeve. Now these are $32 in my shop and they do come with the scissors. It's the, it's the scissors and the sleeve together. And these are gorgeous, gorgeous, handmade in Canada. Um, by Jennifer Yun, and it has her little um, stamp on the back. And they come in these beautiful little bags with a little card. It says, Canadian handcrafted leather goods using quality leather and locally sourced beeswax. And it has her website there on the back that you can see. As far as I know, I am the only one in the U.S. that has these. So um, if you wanna get them with US shipping, you can get them from me. So I'm going to have some of these ones in ochre this Saturday in the shop update. And coming later this fall, I have a new color. I'm going to have them in this green. And the green is just awesome. I, I, I haven't come up with a good name for this color yet. But you can see it just has some variation. Like as you bend it and work with it, it it just gets a little bit lighter in places and it's just so beautiful. So if you are a green fan, these are gonna be coming up later in the fall. I just have this one right now. So what else is new in the shop update? Amelia needle cases. I don't have those right here right now, but I'll put up some pictures. Now the Amelia needle case, is um, finished in the US. I originally, when I first bought these, I reached out to my supplier and I was told these are made in the US. And I was like, awesome, great, where in the US? And they said, we don't know, we're not sure, but they're made in the US. Basically the supplier called the information up on their 
whatever computer and it said this was made in the US. However, when I received them this time, they said they were made in Pakistan. And so I was like, well, it's not China, but I thought they were made in the US. So I reached out and I said, I thought these were made in the US. And they were like, we're really sorry. We thought they were, were too. Turns out they are made in Pakistan, but they are finished here in the US. The color is added and the finish is added here in the US. So partly US, partly made in Pakistan. But the downside to the old Amelia Needle case is that it was a little bit small and it could only hold the size 18 embroidery needles, which is the largest embroidery needle, but not big enough for weaving in really fat yarn. So I wanted one that was slightly bigger. So the new and improved Amelia Needle case is bigger and it holds both the size 18 embroidery needle and the larger yarn needles, as you can see uh, from the pictures. So I will have those in the three colors that you see up on your screen. I'll have those available in the shop update. It's gonna be great. I'm not gonna have every color of yarn, but I will have a bunch of colors. Also, one thing that I want to do in the yarn section is show how many colors, how many skeins of each color and base are available right now. And if you want a sweater quantity, and let's say I have five in stock and you know you need eight, I want you to be able to pre-order a sweater quantity of eight to be sure that they all come from the same dye lot so that you have that option of not necessarily changing out each row as you're knitting because that's annoying and I don't like to do that. What I like to do when I'm using a hand dye is knit in one skein and then as I'm coming to the end kind of fade into the next skein and mostly that works for me so I don't know I just think it's kind of a pain to be constantly changing out as you know you're knitting but at the same time hand dyed yarn does have variations in it it's not going to be perfectly uniform like yarn that was where the dye was measured out by a machine by you know granular weight us hand dyers we get as close as we can we try our best but part of the beauty of a hand dye is that it is not perfect you know if you want something that's absolutely perfect you know you can buy just you know store-bought machine dyed yarn but I think that hand dyed yarn has those variations and that's a part of its charm that's a part of what makes it so great so Anyway, I want you to be able to pre-order a sweater quantity so that you're sure that you get yarn that was all dyed together so that your chances of it all being the same are, you know, closer together. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. I, I'm so excited. I know I'm talking fast. So anyway, the shop update is on Saturday at noon Eastern time. So set your calendars, go sign up for my newsletter if you haven't done that already, because I will be sending out newsletters about it this week with preview pictures so that you can see what's available in the shop update beyond what I've just talked about right here. So, okay. This week's topic, as promised, is sleeves. I've been wanting to talk about this for a long time. I love sleeves, I love big, fat, fancy sleeves, and I have a lot to say about them today. So I'm very, very excited. We talked about the Bridgerton effect, that took us into the mattress stitch, and now we're gonna talk about sleeves. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and put this up on the screen, and I will go through and talk about these sleeves um, while I have this up on the screen. So the first sleeve here in this picture, which I got off of Google, is a puff sleeve. And I got a, an email from a podcast watcher who sent me the link to the video from Anne of Green Gables where Anne Shirley finally gets the puff sleeve shirt. And of course, you know, her Marissa, is it Marissa, Marilla? I forget, I forget. But she's like, she's so like annoyed with Anne. Anne's like, oh, I have the sleeves. And she's like, oh, you're not even gonna fit through the door. You're gonna have to go sideways. I couldn't figure out how to put that in my video. I think it's probably against copyright rules to do that, but I've linked it below. She sent it to me and it's, it's just adorable. So anyway, puff sleeves 
always makes us think of Anne Shirley. Uh, sleeve number two is called the leg of mutton sleeve, which we saw kind of in the early episodes of Downton Abbey. The leg of mutton sleeve was popular um, in the Victorian period. The third sleeve is the petal sleeve, which um, I think is very pretty, but I feel like if your upper arms are at all something you want to conceal, which I I would like to conceal my upper arms. I'm not a huge fan of them. Petal sleeves kind of show them off. It's not really my favorite kind of go-to sleeve. Number four is a peasant sleeve, which is very similar to number seven, which is the bishop sleeve. And we're gonna talk a lot about the bishop sleeve. The main difference is that the peasant sleeve is kind of a puff at the top and the bottom, where the bishop sleeve is flatter at the shoulder and puffier at the bottom. Sleeve number five is very Shakespearean. It's the Juliet sleeve. Number six is the kimono sleeve. And I'm not exactly sure what sets this sleeve apart, whether it's just cut in one piece. That I think is, is what does it there. Um, sleeve number eight is a bell sleeve, which is very pretty, but not very practical. If you've ever tried to do dishes in a bell sleeve, it's just, no. Now this one shown in this picture is also like a three quarter, which would be more practical. Uh, number nine is one of my favorites, the raglan sleeve. Here it's shown just as a very basic raglan. Now, number 10 is the dolman sleeve. And we're gonna be talking about the difference between the dolman sleeve and the bat wing sleeve as we go on. And number 11 is the lantern sleeve. So this is just one person's opinion of the basic variations on sleeves. Now, I also printed out this one, which shows even more variations. I'm not gonna go through all the details of these, but there are more, and it depends on what your source is. They use diff they, they'll use words interchangeably, such as dolman and batwing, now somebody asked me, because I talked about the bat wing sleeve with my Vesper sweater. A traditional bat wing sleeve goes all the way or almost to the waist. And the sleeve comes up like a wing to be a traditional bat, bat wing sleeve. I almost said Batman. <laughs> to be a traditional bat wing sleeve. And a dolman sleeve just has kind of a dropped armhole. So... However, depending on your source, some people do use dolman and batwing interchangeably. Now, because I knew we were going to be talking about sleeves, I got on Thrift Books and I ordered a couple of books. And these were like $5 um, because they're secondhand. This first one is called The Dictionary of Fashion and it is so much fun. It's a true dictionary, but when you get to sleeves, it goes through an alphabetical Yes, an alphabetical type of sleeve, all in one sleeve, a modest sleeve, sleeve with a tight cuff button at the wrist, worn, at wrist, worn in the 1830s. So it's very detailed, which is really cool. Um, it has the definition of a bat wing sleeve here. It says, long sleeve cut with deep armhole, almost to the waist, made tight at the wrist, giving wing-like appearance when arm is extended, a variation of the dolman sleeve. But if you look up dolman sleeve, it says also called bat wing sleeve. So interchangeable, I guess, depending on who you listen to. But there are lots of different pictures here. Here we have a bell sleeve and once again, the bishop sleeve. I love a bishop sleeve. I feel a bishop sleeve coming on. Like I feel like we're, we're going to be seeing some of that for me. It's very 70s, particularly with uh, like a vest type of a look with the bishop sleeve. I think that would be awesome. Um, but this definition is just so, I mean, this dictionary is just so cool. It has lots of different definitions with pictures. It's really cool. This is the third edition um, the Fairchild Dictionary of Fashion, and I feel like it's going to give me a lot of, 
ability to look stuff up because sometimes these things are hard to find on even on the internet like you'd think it would be easier because the internet is huge but frankly sometimes these things are hard to find so another book that i picked up from thrift books is this fashion encyclopedia and this is interesting because it's more like runway fashion as you can see from the cover but it does have a section on sleeves and it's interesting what they chose to highlight a lot of ones that I really either haven't seen before or have seen under a different name. For example, this here is called a balloon sleeve, but that to me looks like a leg of mutton sleeve. So, you know, I guess it depends on who you're listening to. Here we have a picture of a cap sleeve and a bishop sleeve done in a very kind of 70s manner with those opaque tights. So fun, so interesting. It just makes me want to go crazy with knitwear design and sleeves, but this is kind of what happens to me this time of year. As soon as the weather cools off, I go crazy for knitting. Now, here we have a picture of a backless dress with a dolman sleeve looking very 70s, very late 60s, early 70s. And this is called a gigo, gigo sleeve, but again, looks to me like leg of mutton, right? So, you know, here we have a sleeve called a pagoda sleeve. Very interesting. Um, this sleeve is not this exact one, but another variation of it is shown in the dictionary with another name, like a hanging sleeve, where the sleeve kind of overhangs where your arm sticks out. But you know, I guess there's as many variations as you wanna do. Here we have a sabo sleeve, which is this one here, and a slashed sleeve, which is very like, um, if you watch any period pieces of like, you know, Henry VIII or, you know, that time period, you see a lot of things like this. But a lot of these are historic and, you know, maybe haven't come back, but it would be cool to see those come back. Here we have uh, cuffs, a, a jante, a gajante, sleeve cuffs made up of scalloped ruffles of fine lace or cambric worn singly in double or triple layers during the 17th and 18th century, as shown there. The fluffy sleeves, basically. And here we have a few different type of cuffs, which is slightly less interesting because uh, those would not be knitted. But that's really it. After that, it goes to construction and shaping, and you just see all sorts of interesting pictures there. So if you're interested in stuff like this, I highly recommend buying books like this used you know, knew this was a $30 book, but I'm guessing it was published in the 90s, maybe? Let's see. This was published 2015. Does not look it. I would guess late 80s, early 90s, but I think, again, I paid like $5 for it used. So uh, thrift books, I think. But there's another book called, um, another uh, website called a, A, B, A, B, E books, A books, is that it? But you can find lots of good used books on the internet and they have even more information than the internet itself. So as you may have guessed, this week, our word of the week is sleeve. And it comes from the Old English West Saxon sleeve or slef, meaning the arm covering part of a garment probably literally that into which the arm slips from the Proto-Germanic, Middle Low Germanic Slaven, which means to dress carelessly as if, you know, to say like slovenly, interesting. The Old High German Slaufen, to put on or off. It's also related to the word slipper, uh, slefico from the Old English meaning to slip on or to slip on over the arm in the case of sleeves. So to have something up one sleeve comes from the 1500s because large sleeves used to double as pockets, which totally makes sense, right? Um, 
To have a card up one's sleeve in the figurative sense was like to have a hidden resource from the 1840s, once again, to have a card up your sleeve is to be considered like a cheat. When was the printing press invented? Was that in the 1840s or right around there? Because that would make a lot of sense why a lot of these things date from there. Uh, to wear one's heart on one's sleeve is from Othello, Shakespeare's Othello, and that's from 1604. So, all you ever thought you might want to know about sleeves or maybe more. Okay, knitting fantasies. So I searched the internet for knits with interesting sleeves. And interestingly enough, one of the first things that came up is a book called Green Gable Knits. <laughs> which I thought was awesome. Now, if you go to Amazon, you can only see the cover. You can't get like pictures of the patterns that are in there. Does anybody have that book? Does it have any good sleeve um, knits in there? It feels like it has to, right? Um, so anyway, I picked this book, but I don't know what's in it. So it's available on Amazon if you are interested. If you're a lover of Green Gables and you're interested in the book, you can find it there. My second pick is the Ottawa Jumper by Brenda Made This on Etsy. This sweater comes in three sizes, and but it only goes up to a 46 inch bust. So depending on what your size is, um, you know, if you'll fit into either the small, medium or the large, if that would be a good fit for you. The yarn is listed as super chunky, which, um, I would guess is probably like a super bulky, but I don't know for sure. Probably, because it uses sizes US 15 and 19 needles. So I'm guessing that's probably a super bulky. Now this sweater is a $10 pattern, which I think is a little pricey for three sizes, but you know, it's only $10, it's lunch, right? So um, if you especially love the sweater, I think it's super cute. Looks like it would knit up super fast and be really warm. So the Ottawa sweater by Brenda made this. Um, I tend to do my sweater patterns at $7. I've noticed they're creeping up over on Ravelry, but I feel like $7 is a reasonable price for a pattern. My shawls and sweaters are seven, uh, hats are five and socks are six. That's where I, my patterns sit right now, but you know, who knows, inflation may drive them up, but I, I kind of feel like I like keeping the patterns at a low price point. I picked this cool sweater from Etsy also. It is a 1930s bishop sleeve sweater. It's a vintage pattern. It's $2.79, but it looks like it is only for a 34 inch bust. So, you know, if you're somebody who could adapt patterns, I think that would be really cool. But it, like I said, it only comes in the one size, but it is really neat. I really like the look of old vintage patterns. I love how it says to use double pointed needles. And if you don't have them, just pop the caps off your needles and use a knife to sharpen, sharpen one end. <laughs> how resourceful were they in the 30s, right? So resourceful. Um, my last pick is this gray sweater with seed stitch and braided sleeves from Love Crafts. This pattern also comes in three sizes, but it is a free pattern. Um, I thought it was really cute. It only has this one picture. I like how there are kind of the holes in the sleeves around the braid. It's not just like a traditional cable. It's, it's braided in such a way that it leaves holes, which I think are really cool and interesting. Um, so anyway, you know, you can search them up, patterns with interesting sleeves. If you like that, I have a feeling I'm going to be putting out a few myself because I love cool sleeves. I've kind of always loved cool sleeves. Maybe I have a little bit of Anne Shirley in me, as is evidenced by my constant speech. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I also, as I mentioned last time, my, it's so funny that it's my own pattern and I can't think of the name. My Go Lightly sweater has puffed sleeves. It's more like a puff sleeve or a leg of mutton sleeve. It just has a puff in the sleeve, 
but because it is a, a DK weight pattern, it's not too poofy. It's only a little bit poofy. It ends up looking more blousey than poofy. But like I said, there will be more fun sleeves from me. So here's what happened. I am coming to the end of my stash <clears throat> of So Here's What Happened stories. If you have a knitting story, and I know that you do, so many of you have messaged me and said, Devin, I have a story and I'm going to send it to you. Send it to me because I'm running out. <clears throat> but I have a lovely story about Grandma Mary. This is sent to me by a podcast watcher. I have two stories about Grandma Mary. I'm going to share one this week and one next week, but it's just, they're just so sweet. They're so delightful. Here is the first story. <clears throat> the first thing that you need to know about my Grandma Mary is that she is one of the sweetest, most caring people I have ever met. And she would do things for people just because they asked, including making two little flower girl dresses for my wedding. My Grandma Mary grew up very poor. In her childhood, she only ever had one doll. They had a house fire and she lost her only doll in that fire and it was never replaced. In my mid twenties, I worked in a fabric store and a doll pattern came in and her name was Mary. So I cleverly asked my boss if I could make up the doll as a sample and was told yes. Mary was made with much care and much love because the idea came to me to send the doll to my grandma Mary. I had to wait a while. The doll had to stay in the store until all the patterns sold. It took almost six months of hard selling before I managed to sell the last one and was able to take Mary home. I immediately boxed her up and sent her to my grandma. She called me crying, thanking me for making the doll for her. In all her years, no one had thought what it might mean to her to have the doll replaced. I lost my grandmother, Mary, several years ago, and I'm not sure what happened to her doll. I hope one of the great grandchildren got it and loved it as much as my grandmother did. It sticks with me, remembering the joy that one simple handmade doll, lovingly crafted, gave her. I hope she is smiling down, knowing how much joy it brought to my life <clears throat> to be able to make it for her. What a beautiful story. Oh my gosh, that story is so sweet. I feel like a lot of us had a grandma like that who is very generous. Um, probably her grandma lived, was kind of generationally the same as my grandma who grew up in the post-depression when they didn't have very much. And just the having one doll that was lost in a fire, oh my gosh. It breaks my heart that no one replaced the doll until until you did, Florence. Like, that's just so sweet. I love that you did that for her. And that's such a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing that. If you have a knitting story, email it to me, devin at knittingmcpearly.com. If it is funny or heartwarming or sweet or gut-wrenching or embarrassing, um, I can share your name or I cannot share your name. Totally up to you. I would love a video because then we get to see your face as you tell the story. Or if you would prefer that I read it, you can email it to me and I will read it for you. But send me stories because next week is my very last story. I have another Grandma Mary story to share. Um, but until then, thank you for joining me. I loved talking with you about sleeves. Can't wait to share my future knitting patterns with you. Put Saturday at noon, I think it's the 3rd of September, pretty sure it's the 3rd, on your calendars or sign up for my newsletter and come and join me for that. Until then, I will see you next week. Bye, knitters.